Praise God. I'm so thankful for purpose. Amen? Aren't you thankful for purpose? You know, we were driving the other day, and Braden asked me, Jeez, you, what is our, why did God create us? What is our purpose? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. He asked me many questions that I'm like, Lord, <laughs> Lord. Um, of course, we know we were created to worship him. We were created for fellowship and relationship with him. And, but we were created for a purpose. And amen, every one of us has a purpose. And I've just been thinking about, um, you know, in the, in the age that we're in, the season that we're in right now, that there is purpose for us. We were born for such a time as this. And I don't want to miss out on my purpose for this hour. Amen, do you? I know you don't because that's why you're here. You're here for on purpose because you have a purpose. So I, I just had it in my heart just to express some things about prayer and in line with praying out the plan for your purpose. Uh, I want to read something to you before I jump into it, though. This comes from a book that I've been reading. It's by Miles Monroe. He says, the price of, of greatness is responsibility. These words were spoken by Winston Churchill. They contain a truth that should be guarded and heeded. The graveyards are full of great men and women who never became great because they did not give their ability responsibility. This untapped ability is called potential. Each one of us comes into the world pregnant with unlimited potential. We are capable of much more than what we've already done unless we expose during the course of our lives, all that God has placed within us for the good of mankind, our potential will be aborted. The graveyards are full of great men and women who never became great because they do not give their ability responsibility. So how do we become responsible for our ability and our purpose? And the answer is prayer. And I know that seems so easy. Now that's just the first step. There's many more things that we can do. But uh, I know it seems like a simple, logical answer. But I think we don't give enough weight to what prayer can do and what it should be doing in our lives. Truly, if we truly, really believed in the ability within us to make change through our prayer life, we would do it more. I just really, truly believe that. And so I've asked the Lord, God, show me, reveal to me the power that's on the inside of me because I know you've placed your spirit inside of me and the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in me. And so I have that same power and ability. You have that same power and ability on the inside of you to make a change and to make a difference in this world. But we have to believe it. We have to tap into it. We have to do something about it. We have to activate what's on the inside. I, I recently got a um, present for my birthday. Um, how many know what an ember is? Do you all know what an ember is? It's a, a cup that is fancy. It's heated. It has, uh, you can connect it to your phone. There is a, a, an app. And it has the ability to keep your coffee warm for 90 minutes. It's amazing. It makes me happy, <laughs> unless I get down to the bottom before I finish it out but, um, or before it gets cold. But it's amazing. But when I got it, it came in a box, and it came with instructions, and it had all this purpose within it to make me happy. But it wasn't until I activated what was on the inside, the ability that was within that thing, to do its purpose for my life I didn't appreciate it. Same as when we get a phone. We get these cell phones, these expensive cell phones, and you have to activate your phone. You've got to switch everything over. It's not going to serve its purpose until there's some activation, right? So each one of us come like that. We're equipped with purpose. There is potential. There is dynamic potential and purpose on the inside of each one. And a lot of people will die, unfortunately, without having tapped into the greatest potential that they have on the inside. And I keep telling the Lord, I don't want to be that one. Tell me what it is that I need to be doing in this hour 
And he keeps telling me that prayer is the place to find the answers. So I'm going to just express to you what I feel like the Lord has been showing me. And I know it seems simple, but yet, if you'll walk with me in this, you'll see some things that I think I've been discovering um, that really hammer the, the note that prayer is absolutely the key for you fulfilling your potential. So when we lived in Ohio, we were feeling that transition. How many know what transition feels like? It's some, somewhat uncomfortable. And you know something's up, and I was praying and y'all are smiling over there, so somebody must be transitioning. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I was praying about the unknown, and I was like, God, I know there's, there's more for us. There's more. I, I know something's up. There's some transition. And I kept hearing these words, the plan is in the man, but it's in another land. And I thought, I am not trying to be Dr. Seuss here. I'm hearing the plan. <laughs> It's in the man, but it's in a different land. And, of course, I knew there was a plan on the inside of my husband. He was carrying, birthing, getting ready to birth something, and that was this church. There was a plan for something, and it was residing within him. And my ability to hook up with whatever that plan was, that was my job as his help me, because it was a part of my plan, too. Uh, and I had to hook up. And then I remember... Um, God gives me stuff really weird. He, he, maybe he just knows how I work, so he has to, like, get it into my head. <laughs> but we were in worship one time, and I heard him say, get ready, get ready, get ready. And I was like, for what, for what, for what? <laughs> and then I heard him another time later, I heard him say, get ready, get set. And then later, I heard him say, Go. And so it was our time. It was our time to go. And I thought it meant something else. You know how you try to define things in prayer. And as soon as you hear get ready, get ready, you take away from that and go, oh, this means this. Instead of staying here and letting the Holy Spirit reveal it to you, you come over here in your own understanding. And you mix all your own understanding with what he just said. And you get off in la-la land and get it totally confused. You have to stay in that place in the Spirit because sometimes things come like a puzzle in pieces. It doesn't all come at once. So he wants to he wants you to find that place in the secret place where you're just it's like treasure. You're digging out what he has next. What does this mean, God? Get ready for what? So one of the most precious things that we have in our life is God's plan. You know, we grew up knowing that there was a plan of God on our lives, that there was purpose. Y'all probably did too. And that we were to protect that that we were to guard it, that we were not to let anything steal that from us. You know, what is the very thing the enemy does well? He steals, he kills, and destroys. He likes to rob us of our purpose, does he not? It's the very thing that he knows that we're here for. We're here to worship God. We're here to fulfill the plan of God. And if he can rob us of the very thing that we're here for, then he, he has one up on us, right? And it's not just about us. It's about God. He's trying to win. He's been trying to win all along. Of course, we know he's a defeated foe. But the things that come from God never die. When God puts a plan on the inside of you, it doesn't die. Now, I know there are things that can die because of man's decisions. But when it's God's fulfillment of his plan, it does not die. So we have to activate those plans. So let's look at Ephesians 2, 10. And I'm going to try to watch the time because I have a bunch of stuff I want to throw at you. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's own handiwork. We could stop there and just dwell on that and think, man, I don't know about you. If you've traveled at all, if you've seen the handiwork of God, the creation. We've been to some beautiful places, some amazing places. When we went to Australia, we were like, wow, I want to move here. <laughs> you know, everywhere you go, you're like, I want to move here. <laughs> Went to Hawaii. I want to move here. I mean, everywhere you go, because you're just getting a new glimpse of God's glory everywhere you go. But this part here says we are God's handiwork. That means he's working on us all the time. His workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. Why are we born anew? And it tells it in this next part, that we may do those good works which God predestined he pre-planned planned beforehand for us asking taking i'm sorry taking 
paths which he prepared ahead of time. Notice it says taking, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. There are paths for us to take, and there are paths for us not to take. And we've got to be careful which path we're taking. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Uh, that we may abound and walk in them. Why? To live the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. If we're walking out the plan of God, then it's the good life. It's not a tormented life. It's not a worried life. It's not a distorted life. It's not a sad life. The path that God puts us on is a good life. And if we're experiencing some other things that are tormenting and fear and all these things, then we're not on the path correctly. We might be on the path, but we might have a bad attitude. Maybe there's some things that are being thrown at us, and we're meditating on something else instead of the path that he has for us. We have to be careful. We could be completely off the path, and that might be why we're being tormented. We need to be careful that we're on the path of the good life. So we need to not pass off the plan of God with wrong relationships, wrong places, bad habits. Nothing is worth the exchange of the plan of God. Amen? Anything less will cause you to live discontented, hard to live with. How many have ever had an experience with somebody who they're just hard to live with, they're fault-finding uh, in others, they're blaming everybody else for their dissatisfaction in life, and it causes them to veer off the path because their focus is on everything that's wrong on the inside, and but it's because they're on the wrong path. Or their eyes are on the wrong thing, right? But he gives our lives purpose. I'm so thankful for that. In verse 10, if you look back, it says, we are born anew to do good works. What are we born anew to do? We're good works, his purpose. He doesn't force us. Have, has God ever forced you to do anything? It's up to us to choose it, and it's up to us to take the path. Praise God. It's not automatic. How many know that the plan of God is not automatic? Not, some Christians would probably argue with me on this. No, I'm a Christian, and now there's a plan, and it's automatic. I'm just going to wait on the Lord, and it's just going gonna, gonna, gonna to happen. It's not just going to happen. You're going to be waiting all your life, and you're going to be singing that song, He's in the waiting, He's in the waiting, and you're never going to see it because you're just waiting and waiting. Now, there's comfort in that song because there is some waiting going on sometimes, but we have to activate the plan and we have to take it. It's prepared for us, but we have to take it. We have to pray out the plan of God for our lives. I don't know if you all know who Doris Day is, but she used to sing that, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, que sera, sera. You guys remember that song? That's so demonic. <laughs> it's not the word. The Bible says that he'll show us things to come. You know, and she sings it so, que sera, sera. It's just so nice and, well, that's just the devil. Whatever will be, will be. That's not right, because God says he gives us a good future and a hope for our future, amen? And the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. I'm not gonna just sit around and wait for what comes to me. I'm gonna activate the plan of God in my life, and I'm gonna walk towards it, and I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take the path that he's prepared for me. Praise God. So, the devil will try to keep you from taking it. He will offer up other things. I once was engaged to another man. Yes, believe it or not. I was on another path. I know, have you all not heard the story? <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord. And I was engaged two times to the same guy. And I won't tell you the whole story, but he was a great guy, really nice guy, Ray McGrad in the ministry, he pastors now, um, really wonderful family, they loved me, great people, my, my family, well, except for my mom, loved him, <laughs> my mom had a lot to do with this, but anyways, praise God for bold mothers following the Holy Ghost, so we were, we were engaged, I had my dress, I had my um, uh, invitations, announcements, we were about two months away, and we broke we broke up, and he moved back home. He is coincidentally from Iowa, Lindsay. <laughs> and uh, so <clears throat> we kept in touch, and I knew I was not on the right path. There was that itching, that knowing on the inside, this isn't right. But I wanted what I wanted. 
I'm determined to get what I want, you know. <laughs> so we got back together. He moved back. He got his good job back. Everything was good. Till my mom marched back up there. And it ended again the second time and for the final time. And then soon after that, well, let me go back. And then I was crushed. I thought, oh, this is it. You know, I, I was really devastated. And um, I prayed. I lived on my own. I really sought God. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed out the plan and asked God, what's next for me? I didn't just sit in the depths of despair and say, well, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be. Lord, bring it to me whenever, you know, I'll just be here. No, I activated my faith, and I knew God had a plan, and I started praying. Then I see Stephen Bierman walking through the hallways. Aha, that must be the plan. <laughs> so everything that's happened in my life, as far as fulfilling the ministry, the walks that we've walked out, the, the people that we've touched, everything that we've done has been because of praying out the plan. Amen? And we're not done. We're still praying out the plan. We need to pray out the plan every day. There's part of the plan that I'm fulfilling right now. It requires prayer. There's something you're going to do tomorrow and touch somebody, and it's a part of the plan of God, and you have to pray about it. You have to seek God about it. Amen? I'll tell a little bit on Buddy. He had an opportunity to, to go to Google uh, and work for Google, and they prayed out the plan and prayed out the plan, and there was lots of things that looked really good. The money looked good. The offer looked good. I won't go into all the details, but it was very, very tempting, right? And he just said, I got to go pray out the plan. So he went out, got to himself for a couple days, prayed out the plan, didn't feel good about it. And I won't, I'm not telling at all, but they went there and came back. And Anyway, um, when he got back, there was a man that he worked with, I might not be telling the story correctly, who, uh, long story short, he ended up being in his car, right? And was about to commit suicide, right? And Buddy stopped this man from taking his life, basically. He intervened, Right? And, uh, and it, it's really, we really see it. And, and, and it's not just that. There were other things, and probably his whole life now, up to this point, God has blessed him and increased him and multiplied him and put him in positions that are beyond probably. And look at Google in California now. It would be like, ah, they're all coming here. So come on, the Californians are coming here. So we see the fulfillment of God's plan even with, you know, with just those little things, those little opportunities. We have to pray out everything. Every opportunity that comes to you is not necessarily God. The enemy comes with very flashy opportunities for us to get us diverted and to get us off course. I was driving to Oklahoma in the early stages of us moving here, and I'm a little bit directionally challenged at times. <laughs> And I'm on the freeway. I don't know if I had driven it that many times. But I had gotten off to get gas. And there was a man there that was asking for money. Of course, I, I'm wanting to minister. I'm like, what do you need? You know, and I'm honing in on what his needs are. And he starts acting crazy. I realize he's possessed with the devil. He was possessed with the devil. And he just started going nuts on me. And I was like, okay. I almost got irritated because it was like, you could tell it was just a diversion. And I, I helped him a little bit, and then I got in my car. And I was so mad about it. I got in the car. I drove 30 minutes the wrong way. How do you do that? Well, I had gotten so caught up in this spiritual atmosphere of what was going on with this confusion with this man, the devil, that it created such havoc in my spirit. I get in the car. And I'm just thinking about it and thinking about it and praying in the spirit because I was so stirred about it. And I didn't realize that I was going the wrong way for 30 minutes. Now, let me just tell you, that can happen to us spiritually speaking. We can get so off course when we get connected with the wrong people, when we, we get, I don't know, some message from somebody, somebody said something, something might happen in your life that just causes all kinds of havoc. You might be going through a challenge right now, and it's creating this, this confusion in your mind, and it's hard for you to know what the plan and the will of God is. I'm telling you, get in the spirit. Get in your prayer closet. Pray out the plan of God. 
I've heard it over and over again from men and women of God. When you are in the middle of a decision and you don't know what to do, you pray in the spirit because you're praying out the plan of God. I heard a story of a man who was getting ready to take a church and he um, was praying and he said in his prayer closet, in his spirit, he saw a track being laid out and then the longer he prayed, more track. And he saw this train coming down this track and uh, bless you. And, uh, <laughs> and he saw that train coming down the track and as he kept praying and praying, there was more track being laid and the Lord was showing him that there is a requirement of prayer to lay out the track for the train to go for wherever it is God's taking you. And so many people want to make decisions and do major things, consult banks and all kinds of things without consulting God first. We have to consult God before we consult anybody else, right? So we know what his plan is. So, and even, you know, we could sit down. I know it's a big deal to sit down and write the pros and the cons of things. That's just tapping into the natural man, the natural mind of things. Some things that God has you do don't make sense right? When we came down here to, to start this church, we had no zero, negative zero support. Well, Buddy, Buddy and uh, Sandra support us when they, we came down, uh, but they were not in the position they're in now, so it, we were just starting, and we were, uh, what do they call us, a parachute? A parachute church? I think there's different names for them, where they just drop you and here you go, have fun, <laughs> Um, but just, you know, it didn't make sense. We went from a very uh, comfortable position paid wise to, what was it? $12 an hour? <laughs> Not very much. And just, you know, really thinking, okay, Lord, this is your plan. And, and I'm not going to say it was completely easy. It's, it's not been completely easy. But, but God's plan is the best plan for us. Amen. I'd rather be right smack dab in the middle of the plan and the will of God than to be out doing some crazy thing and know that I'm missing him and having fun doing it. It's just not fun, right? Praise God. So we have fulfilled the ministry together. We are doing what God's called us to do all because we prayed out the plan and we continue to do so. So praying out the plan, there is an unfolding of the plan that takes place. There's an unfolding. This, you don't know everything today. I know there's more things. There's more vision for this church and we don't know it all right now. There's vision for our nation. There's vision for our state. There's vision for every family in this church. We don't know it all. That's why prayer is necessary for us to be lifting up each and every day. So the unfolding of the plan takes place. Amen? And there's accuracies that need to be uh, in motion. We need to know specifics on how God wants us to move, when he wants to move. You know, we've been praying about starting a Bible study. We're praying about the accuracy of, not the Bible study, a Bible school, uh, the accuracy of the timing of those things. We don't want to do something just because the church down the street does it. You know, I've had people write me and say, well, this church does stuff this way and ch this church does. I don't care what any other church does. I'm not following after another man's leading. I'm following after the Holy Spirit's leading. Now, there's some great ideas and some things that we could possibly implement, but we're not going to follow after the agendas of man. We're going to follow after the Holy Spirit's agenda. Amen? Because that's where his plan is for us. Amen? How many have seen my husband's most favorite movie, The Titanic? Have you? No. <laughs> I'm being facetious. He hates that movie. He hates movies that are uh, predictable. And then he sits there and predicts it the whole time we're, we're watching it. He'll tell me what's going to happen anyway. So, But um, I, I, just did, I did a little review on this movie because I thought it was interesting how... You guys remember what happened, right? It was the unsinkable ship. You know, no, no sink in this one, right? But it sank, right? April 14th, 1912, over 1,500 people died. So I was really curious because we know it hit that iceberg, but I wanted to just kind of find out exactly what was it, the, the inaccuracies that caused it to go down. So it was moving too fast. Sometimes we can move too fast with God. We can get out of the plan by doing things too quickly and we'll crash. It was off course. It ran into that 
And seven times people tried to send messages to them to let them know that they were off course and they never got the message. It's important that we're tapped into the Holy Ghost so he can show us when we're off course so we don't, we don't crash, amen? They ignored warnings. God always makes a way of escape. And if we ignore warnings, then we could be in big trouble. So we have to be tapped into the spirit and hearing his voice and not ignore those warnings. They cut corners. They were cutting corners. There were things that they were supposed to do that they didn't do because they were trying to hurry and get ship off or whatever that's called. Um, so they were cutting corners. Never cut corners with what God has you to do. Always be thorough. Always be accurate with what he has you to do. When you cut corners, you cut him out. It's important that you keep him uh, in control. I didn't know this. They had no eyes to see. They had lost their binoculars. They had lost their binoculars. Did y'all know that? I didn't know it. It's true. I looked it up. They had lost their main binoculars, and the, and it and it was the visibility was low, and it was very still that night. But the they were kind of surrounded by all these icebergs or ice whatever, and um, it created this like. <clears throat> just an eerie thing where they, there was all this smoke and fog and whatever, and they just ran right into it because they were going too fast. And the last thing, there were not enough boats. The reason why there were not enough boats, and y'all know that if you watch the movie, the inspector that was inspecting things did not want to lose his job, so he just shoved them on out and said, okay, go. He knew they did not have enough boats. He gave the go. So it's important that we don't cut corners. It's important that we're following after the Holy Spirit. It's important that we're not dismissing those nudges. It's important that we're listening fully to his voice and what he has for us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so Romans 8, 26. I'm not going to get through all this. So two, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and hears us, bears us up in our weaknesses. Then he tells us what our weakness is. What is our weakness? For we do not know what to pray. We don't know how to pray sometimes to offer or how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication. He meets our supplication. If there's no supplication, then there's nothing to meet. If there's no supplication, if there's no prayer, then there's nothing to meet. The Holy Spirit meets us there. And he pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. So in prayer, we can articulate what is the mind of the Spirit and what needs to be understood. There's a place in prayer where we can articulate what the Holy Spirit is saying. If we're staying in that place long enough, we can hear him. Now, I want to just put a big red flag by saying when we get into prayer, we don't need to go in with our understanding trying to figure everything out. Now, I know there's times when we go in the prayer and we hear things very easily and things come to us. Let it come naturally. Let it come up from your belly. Don't go in trying to figure out every little word that you're, you know, saying by the Spirit. And Oh, that's what that means, and that's what that means. You know, we can, we can follow after uh, the flesh. We can follow after um, uh, some really weird things if we're just trying to make sense of everything. We don't need to make sense of everything. We need to get in that place where we're just praying out the plan of God. When we pray out the plan, we pray out mysteries and secrets, but we're praying out the perfect plan of God. And that's what I love when we pray in the Spirit, is I'm not dependent on myself. I don't have to even think about it. I can just hook up with the Holy Spirit, and his mind is revealed on the inside of me as I'm praying that out. Isn't that good? Romans 8, 27 says, And he who searches the heart of men knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. The Holy Spirit will never, never give direction that is not in line with the Word of God. If somebody comes to me and tells me something that's completely out of line, out of line with the Word of God and says, I got this in prayer, I say, go back and find the place where you found that in the scripture and show it to me because that does not line up with the word of God. Everything should line up. Amen? Romans 8, 28. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, he's a partner in our labor. What are we laboring? Prayer. Prayer. Because this is right after all this other scripture. It's our, our time of prayer. 
All things work together and are fitting into a plan or good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Now we, a lot of people like to quote the scripture, all things work together for those who, who are, all things work together for good for those who are praying. That's what the scripture really means. If you look at it, we are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, their laboring in prayer, comes right after the supplication part. All things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Now, I, I think sometimes we cut out that part that we're in prayer because it's connected to the labor, the part, the supplication in verse 27. He searches the heart of men who knows, I'm sorry, verse 26, where he helps us in our weaknesses. He helps us to supplicate. He comes to our aid. You guys see what I'm saying here? And then it says all things work together when we are partnered with him in our labor, in his, he's partnered with us in our labor of praying. So prayer sets the plan of God in motion for our life. Look at Matthew uh, 6, 9 through 10. You guys are familiar with the scripture. It says, pray therefore like this. So Jesus is telling his disciples, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's telling everybody to pray. What are we, why are we having to pray? Because we're having to pray the will of God. What is the will of God? Well, it's happening in heaven all the time, but it's not happening here on earth. So he's telling us to pray the will of God here on earth. A lot of people think that God's in control of the earth. He is not in control. He's given the, the control of the earth over to, to us, right? And so it's important for us to operate in the authority that we have, that he's given us. Why would Jesus tell us to pray the will of God on earth as it is in heaven if it was already in operation? If the will of God is already in operation, we don't need to pray the will of God that's in heaven on earth, right? Am, are you getting it? Are you, I, I saw this today. I thought, well, we need to pray out the plan and the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. So his will has to have our prayers attached to it. Our prayers make things happen. I know there are fathers of faith that have gone before us that had a real specific anointing on their lives. I, and I know Brother Hagen was one of them, but there's others. I think uh, Franklin Graham, not Franklin, Billy Graham had the anointing on him to make a difference in the nations with his prayer, their prayers. And when Dad Hagen went uh, home to be with Jesus in 2003, I was flying to go to the funeral because we had been asked to come to, to sing for it. And I, I heard the Holy Spirit say, there's a shift in the winds of the Spirit that's taking place right now. And I really think that he had and others have had such a hold on the importance of praying out the plan of God, the will of God in our nation and for those who are in authority. And I think there's some things that have been taking place lately because the church has not been taking their place to pray for those who are in authority like we should have until recent events. See, that's our job, is to pray out the will and the plan of God on the earth and pray out what God has for us here and now. Amen? And so we have a place in the Spirit to pray out what God wants that's taking place in, in the nations right now. It's true. Look at James 5, 7. So God has a will for the earth, he has a will for the nation, he has a will for our state, he has a will for this church. There, there is a purpose and a plan. And so James 5 says, so be patient, brethren, as you wait till the coming of the Lord. See how the, the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest for the land. See how he keeps up his patient vigil over it and it receives the earth, it, I'm sorry, it receives the early and the late rains. So the gathering of the fruit requires what? Rain. So what does he want from the earth? The will of God for the earth is for the gathering of the fruit. But what's required for the gathering of the fruit? Rain. So what do we need to pray for? Rain. We need to pray for the rain. The rains of the spirit. Amen. 
Matthew 9, 37. 9, 37, 38 says, Then he said to the disciples, The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray. He's telling us to pray. This is the will. Pray to the Lord of a harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. So what, what do we pray for? We pray for the harvest because it's ready, but we pray for the laborers because the laborers are few. We pray for laborers. Amen? His will for the nation, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. First of all, that means it's a priority. Then I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be offered on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in position of authority and high responsibility, that outwardly we may, pa we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life, and inwardly a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good and right, and it is pleasing and acceptable to God and our Savior. And verse 4, it says, who wishes all men to be saved. This is his will, his will for the nations all men to be saved and increasingly to perceive and recognize and discern how precisely and correctly the divine truth. So this is his will so that they live in the knowledge of the truth. It's his will for them to come to the Lord and it's his will for them to come to the knowledge of the truth. So for your family members who've come to the Lord but are not walking in the light of things, we don't have to pray for their salvation, but we pray that they would live in the revelation of the truth and the knowledge of who they are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So this scripture here is, is very, it's a very political setting of scriptures, if you will. And it's important that we understand that we do have a place here. There is a place for us to pray out the will of God for the nations. Amen? Just because someone wins or doesn't win doesn't mean that it's God's plan. The church has to pray the will of God for the nations. Amen? Anything that God has said about his will for your life, the nation, this country, we have to watch over it to see that it is accomplished. God says he watches over his word to perform it. I think he wants us to watch over the word that we put out, the prayers that we put out to see that it's done. When you have children, do you just say, okay, I had a kid. Go ahead, go on, you're good. No, we, we watch over them to make sure they're protected. We, we speak into their life. We, we nurture them and raise them up to, under the admonition of the Lord till they're ready to, to step out on their own. And there's some things in prayer that have yet to be developed, and we have to watch over those things. We don't just say, okay, I prayed for that, I'm done. No, there's some things that we need to continue to add our faith to because that's what this is all about. It's our faith in action. It's our faith being activated. It's being a doer of the word. Amen? Praise God. Are y'all getting this? Amen. So, John 16, 13. I'm going to skip on a little bit here. John 16, 13 says, But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth, for he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. And he will give the message that has been given to him. And he will announce and declare to you things that are to come, that will happen in the future. So if it were automatic, would he need to show it to us? If his will was just automatic, would he need to show us anything to come? Or would we just sit back and be in that waiting place and say, here it comes? No, it's not automatic. We have to pray out the plan. There are many things on the earth right now that are pending. They've got a pending note on them, waiting on our prayers. What do our prayers do? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its workings. So we're making power available for the Holy Spirit to take that power over here and do some workings to push out the devil out of some places and the nations and in our leadership and some things that are going on in our state that need to, t to be moved around and maneuvered around, but they can't happen until you open your mouth and declare some things that the Word of God has said. I gave a, I didn't have this prepared, but I gave a scripture 
in the ladies a couple weeks ago. I think it's been a month now. There's a scripture in Revelations where Jesus, it talks about Jesus having a sword in his, coming out of his mouth. And the question is, why would he have a sword coming out of his mouth? Because there are, there is, there are words that come out of our mouth and it's a two-edged sword. God said it first and then we speak it secondly. And out of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So there's some things that he said, but it's re gonna require us to come up in line with it and activate what needs to happen here on earth. We are ambassadors. We are ambassadors here on the earth. And we are here for such a time as this. So I'm just saying, let's not get lazy. Let's not be lazy Christians. Let's not get so preoccupied with our own world. Our mind is so settled. We're just kind of settling in, just kind of riding this COVID thing out. Let's just see what happens. Let's just see. No. We're called in this season to make a change and to make a difference. How do we do that? With your mouth, with your prayer life. You can make change. We're not just sitting back waiting on stuff to happen. No, God's given us power. The power is available, dynamic in its workings when we pray out the plan of God. Amen? Praise God. James, I already I quoted that to you, James 5.16. 5.17, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. We've been studying about Elijah. What an amazing man. And he prayed earnestly for it not to rain. God already said it wasn't going to rain. Didn't he? Didn't he say it wasn't going to rain? But he, it says here that Elijah prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Why did he need to pray it out if God already said it? Because there's an activation that needs to take place with our prayers. We activate what God has said. There's an alignment that we come up with him and we activate what he is, is wanting, his will here on earth. Amen? So seeing it through kind of prayers, that's what we need to have right now. Seeing it through kind of prayers. Prayers that are availing much. Prayers that are going to the end. Prayers that don't give up. Prayers that don't just get weak because we're not seeing things change. Prayers that are not moved by what we see, what we feel, what we hear. But only moved by what the power of God is saying and doing in our heart, in our spirits. Amen? What has God said to you? What has he promised you? What's in your heart that you've not seen accomplished? What are some things that God has deposited in, you, in your spirit, some seeds that you've yet to see? Well, how much have you prayed it out? How much prayer have you set in motion to what God has said over your life? Because I know probably everyone sitting here has had a word of prophecy over you at some time or another, and you tuck it away in the closet, or you tuck it away in the drawer, and you say, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. If it's really coming to pass, then that prophet was right. If it doesn't come to pass, then he was false. No. All a prophecy is, is a work mandate for you to align your prayers along with it and say, God, this is what has been given to me. I want to align my heart with this. And if this is your will, then I'm going to pray out the plan of God for my life in this area. You know what, guys? I got quickened in my spirit about this for us because there's more to be had. There is more to be had, but it is not going to be had until we pray it out. There is not going to be more in this church until we pray it out. There's not going to be more in your life until you pray it out. You're just going to lay back and just live life. Or are we going to pray it out? The children of Israel, were told, they were told there's a land flowing with milk and honey. They never arrived. The first generation never arrived. We know they were complainers. Complainers are remainers. They stay. They never move forward. If you complain, you remain. Praise, you're raised. But the plan was not automatic. God said, what did God say? There's a land flowing with milk and honey, and it is yours. But they never saw it. You know why they never saw it? Because they were wanderers, and they were waiting for God just to do something. And it was not automatic. They had to take it. They had to take the path. We have to take the path that he's prepared for us. Ephesians 2, we already prayed about or read about. God's plan is activated by believing in believing, there's action. There's believing confessions. There's believing prayer. There's believing expectations. What are you believing for? 
I can sit and talk to you and I can listen to what you say and in 10 minutes tell you what you're believing for or not believing for. Because what's coming out of your mouth is where your faith is lined up. You guys remember the story about the battle of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. I'm not going to read it all. But Jehoshaphat, the king, was faced with three different armies. And he was a king. He could do anything. But you know what he did? The Amplified says that he sought God as his vital need. When's the last time you sought God as your vital need? N vital need. I'm telling you right now, we spend way more time on entertainment and other kind of things than we do with seeking God as our vital need. We are in the middle of a major issue with our world, and if we're not taking time right now to seek God as our vital need, then God be with us. <laughs> I'm serious, y'all. It's time for us to get on our knees. It's time for us to be serious about the season we're in. It's time for us to pray out the plan of God and say, God, what do you want for this church in this area? God, what do you want for Liberty Hill? Liberty Hill that was named after a revival. Because I know you want another revival in Liberty Hill. Revive us, oh God. We can sing 20 minutes up here. Revive us, oh Lord. Uh, refine me, oh God. But what are we doing when we walk out the door? Are we saying, God, I got to have you as my vital need. I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to take vacation and just spend time with you because I need you. You know what happened to Jehoshaphat? God showed him what to do. He said, I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to tell you what to do. He said, this battle is not yours. It's mine, but you're going to go face him. He didn't have to fight him, but he had to face him. What are you Ignoring, what are you not facing in your, in your world right now? What are some relationship things you're not facing? Financial things you're not facing? Issues that you're not facing? God says, I'll be with you. The battle's not yours, but you're going to have to face it. And I'm going to give you the words to say. You know where he found out where those words to say were? In prayer. We don't know what to say unless we're in prayer finding out what God tells us to say. They went before the, battle, the, the armies and they said, God is merciful. He's merciful. And you guys know the story, right? They were defeated. They sent the praisers, praisers ahead. They didn't have weaponry of other kinds. God's weaponry is praise. He sent the praises ahead and they praised God. And the, and the armies defeated themselves. I believe we're going to see some of those things right now in the world, in the earth, and what we're dealing with right now. Our prayers, our prayer lives can lay hold of some things for this generation if we will give ourselves to it. God didn't speak until to Jehoshaphat until Jehoshaphat initiated prayer. He spoke after prayer was initiated. Maybe God's waiting on you to initiate prayer before he's going to speak. God doesn't want you looking around. He wants you to talk to the enemy. And he's going to give you what to say in prayer. Don't be looking around at what's going on in our world right now. Don't be in fear and trepidation. He's called us to be bold as a lion. Amen. Praise God. Daniel is another example. I'll give this to you really quickly because it's too good not to give. But his life was an example of faith working at every level, at every part of the test that he went through. We know what happened with him, and it kind of reminds me of what's happening right now. He was told not to pray. Prayer was taken out of the schools, I mean, his nation. <laughs> you know what Daniel did? He opened his windows, and he prayed. He was bold. They decided to take him and throw him in the lion's den. They were walking him out. Did God rescue him then? No. But you know what? Daniel didn't fear because he had been in prayer three times a day. He'd been fasting. He already saw ahead what God's plan was. He already knew that God was going to rescue him. He already knew. So as he's walking out, going to the lion's den, he's probably, other people, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were probably like, we need a reversal of this decision. Seek the people at the White House. We need a reversal. Do something else. 
But when he was in the lion's den, everything became inactive. The lions possibly couldn't smell, couldn't taste. I don't know. <laughs> there was no activity going on in that lion's den. And you all know the story. He went all the way through that test and was rescued. But heaven had a strategy. Heaven said, you throw my man of God in, I'm going to throw your man in. So he had to walk it all the way out. That He was thrown into that prison or that place of death with the lions. And they were res he was rescued, but then they threw the other men in. You guys know the story. And they were eaten up before they even hit the ground, right? So not only does God want to take us all the way through the test successfully, but he wants to silence our opposers. He wants to quiet those who are coming after us, who are at us. How do we do that? We have to go all the way through the test sometimes. And there's faith for every level of the test. There's faith if we will pray out the plan. We won't have it if we don't pray out the plan. There was deliverance preceding the victory in prayer before he even walked out the plan. So I ask you tonight, what are you activating in prayer for your life? Are you activating some things? Maybe, you know, there's something that you've seen in your heart that you really want. Are you just waiting on it to come? Or are you saying, God, this is what I want in my life. There's, you know, maybe there's a house. Maybe there's a man. <laughs> there's something in your life that you're, that you're waiting on. Don't just wait on, on it to come. Be specific with God. Take it in prayer. Ask God for it. Because if you don't, something's going to come along. And you might just say, oh, this looks good. And it, you may not be right on the path that God has for you, but you might be walking right alongside, just parallel. And that's just good enough for the devil. Because you're not right smack dab in the middle of his will. And on this side over here, parallel to the, the street of where God wants you, is not provision, is not victory. There's defeat over there. There's depression, anxiety. He wants you right in the middle. And the thing that's going to get you right in the middle is prayer. That's going to keep you on track. Amen.